Apologies in mouse models. Julie. Well, thank you for uh, the invitation to speak today. Um, Set up. Okay, so I'm going to actually tell you about a project that is um, a smaller project at the Allen Institute, but it is a project that has been built on the success of a previous platform project, so our Allen Mouse Connectivity Atlas project. So I want to highlight how we can um, use this previous platform uh, to uh, begin to address questions about disease. And. Okay, so for the talk, I'm going to give you a very brief but um, probably somewhat detailed overview still on, oops, going too fast again, on, um, the, on Alzheimer's disease itself. And I really kind of want to use this as more of a chance to provide a commentary on the state of the um, Alzheimer's uh, research field and where we're at now uh, and, and propose a way that we could use the kind of platforms we've, we've um, been building here to improve um, preclinical translation from in the Alzheimer's research world. And then I want to tell you a little bit just briefly about um, the different types of anatomical connecto mapping projects, mostly to put our particular project in a kind of perspective of what we're specifically looking at, and give you a little more detail on the Allen Mouse Connectivity Atlas platform, how it was built, and um, before uh, telling you what our plans are for using this platform to begin to look at uh, connectivity maps and mouse models of disease. So. This is the big slide that um, I think I put too much on one slide. I'm going to try to give you a lot of information here, but not too much information. So Alzheimer's disease is a complex disease. It's a multifactorial disease. The, there's a lot that we know about it and a lot that we don't know about it. Um, it's been, it, it, I would say there's, there's two major forms of the disease just to kind of Refamiliarize people with it since we haven't really talked about it yet. But there's two major forms. There's a genetic form that is an early onset form of the disease, and then there's also a sporadic form that's a late onset, usually late onset form of the disease. Um, it's been known for a long time to be a disease of kind of clinical symptoms that uh, ultimately result in dementia and um, the, the clinical phenotype is really uh, memory loss, the inability to encode new memories, um, and other, other behavioral disturbances that occur in the course of Alzheimer's disease as well. On the other end, um, and I'll describe the spectrum in a minute, but on the other end up here, Alzheimer's disease is also known as one of the neurodegenerative disorders that's um, characterized by the abnormal accumulation and aggregation of proteins. So it's one of these um, proteinopathy diseases. And in particular, in Alzheimer's disease, there are two um, pathological proteins that have been most studied. These are the amyloid beta peptide, which is a peptide that's derived from the amyloid precursor protein, a, a longer protein that's cleaved to produce this potentially toxic peptide. The amyloid beta peptide um, accumulates extracellularly into the plaques that are visible in, uh, in um, tissue postmortem when it's studied. And then the other major pathological hallmark in Alzheimer's disease is the um, uh, microtubule associated protein tau, which becomes abnormally phosphorylated and accumulates and forms these intracellular neurofibrillary tangles. So a lot of effort and time and research has been spent studying these pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease at this end of the spectrum. There are a lot of other pathologies that have been studied and described um, in, in, in this disease, and they can be sort of organized along this scale or this uh, view here, looking at um, different uh, levels of organization of the brain. So from this kind of micro scale down to, up to this macro scale level. So I described the molecular pathologies that have been studied for a long time, the clinical symptoms that have been observed in, in, um, by neurologists, and but there are these several other kind of steps along the way that um, at which many researchers have also described pathologies. So uh, there's cellular pathologies that include altered intracellular signaling networks, loss of neurons, gliosis, loss of other presynaptic, postsynaptic proteins. There are circuit deficits, particularly in synaptic plasticity that seem to be caused by the amyloid beta peptide. There's an, a, a described imbalance in the excitation and inhibition ratios in various circuits. 
And then there's these uh, network pathologies, which are, if we move up the scale, this kind of larger scale network um, changes that include both structural changes in, for example, damage to the white matter as well as atrophy, and also functional connectivity changes. And I'll talk a little bit more in more detail about this particular uh, large scale network that has been described to be affected in Alzheimer's disease, which is the default mode network. So many researchers have spent time studying these molecular pathologies. Many other neurologists have spent time studying the kind of clinical symptoms, and there's not a lot of integration across these different scales. There's some um, proposal, for example, that this amyloid beta peptide is causal for all of these symptoms, but the whether that's true and whether there's this kind of stepwise progression amongst these different types of pathologies that's initiated by the amyloid beta peptide is not known. So there's um, a, a, a real lack of information right now on how we move between these kind of different levels of pathologies. And what I think the the reason I'm pointing this out is because the Alzheimer's research field over the last 10 years has been beset by both you know, lots of successes in terms of um, identifying um, treatments in that successfully um, rescue cognitive deficits and mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. But on the other end, when those, those um, potential therapies have been moved into clinical trials, there is a devastating number of failures in, in this field right now. So there's been no, no new drugs approved for Alzheimer's disease in the last 10 years, I think that's true. There, there was one that was somewhere in that range. So we need help kind of in the field. There, there needs to be some way of improving the translation between preclinical model research and the clinical um, trials that are ongoing in the, in the therapies that ultimately will be successful. So all of this is to say that I think that um, we need mouse models in order to help us try to bridge these different um, levels of pathology because it's really the only, uh, probably the best way at least for, for being able to um, identify hypotheses and probe those um, particular um, hypotheses in, a, in an experimental way. But we also need better translation between mouse models and humans. So one, um, and the previous work has really been spent a lot of times kind of jumping from the molecular level to the clinical level. So one level that has been receiving more attention recently and that I think we should spend even more time looking into is this large scale network level. And part of that is because there have been uh, improvements in imaging technologies for both structural and functional connectivity in mouse and mice as well as in humans. So I'll tell you a little bit more about some of that. Okay. So the, mouse connect, the Allen Mouse Connectivity Atlas is uh, what we call a mesoscale connectome project, and Tim Murphy already introduced this concept, so I won't spend a lot of time on this now, but um, I just wanted to put this into context, that this is the particular uh, brain organization level that we're talking about when we um, say that we have completed kind of a mouse mesoscale connectome. What we mean is, is, is that it's um, this kind of intermediary or intermediate st uh, stage between a macro scale level connectome, which really just gives you the inter-aerial um, or inter-regional connections, and on the other end, the micro scale connectome, which gives you the kind of gold standard of all of the inputs and outputs of a, of a single neuron. This kind of connectome is really limited now by tissue volume and techniques uh, that are available to reconstruct kind of large volumes. Um, and the macro scale level, of course, is ideal for human um, imaging. So this is where we get information in humans. So the, again, the mesoscale level here, we can get both inter-aerial as well as um, uh, connectivity between different cell populations. We still have relatively high resolution and we can use this in animal models and hopefully translate this to um, human data coming from macro scale models. Okay, so this emerging idea that, the, that Alzheimer's disease has um, large scale network pathologies is illustrated um, by this particular uh, slide. There are um, uh, a, there's a particular large-scale network that seems to be most vulnerable in Alzheimer's disease. This is the default mode network, which is shown here on the left. It's a resting state network um, with areas that are coherently active when people are just quietly in, at rest and asked not to perform a task in a fMRI scanner. Um, 
it's been shown that this particular network of areas uh, becomes um, decreasingly coherent, at least, and probably just less active overall in Alzheimer's disease, as shown on the right here. And what's very striking about it is that these particular areas are also the areas that later in disease uh, have the highest levels of amyloid beta deposition. So that's just shown in the red here. You can see the similarity between the areas involved in the default mode network and the areas that have high levels of amyloid deposition. There are also the areas that uh, show this selective um, and significant atrophy earlier in the disease and also have um, hypometabolism. So this has led to a hypothesis that normal connectivity might predict pathology. This is the network degeneration hypothesis. On the other end of this kind of uh, pathology scale that I presented, this uh, molecular level, um, there's been an, a new hypothesis that has have received a lot of attention lately. That's the uh, idea that there's a prion-like propagation or progression of pathology in neurodegenerative disorders. Um, the, this hypothesis has kind of come about in a way that helps to potentially explain some kind of classic literature in the, uh, at least in the Alzheimer's field, in that people have observed for a long time that there's a, a stereotyped pattern of pathology um, across the disease spectrum, so that, and it spreads in a, in a very specific spatial pattern. So this is, um, on the top two panels here, this is the two different uh, molecular pathologies that are most studied in Alzheimer's disease, the amyloid beta and tau. And what they're showing here is the progression of the um, amyloid beta pathology with time in different regions of the brain. So in the case of amyloid beta, it's predominantly in the cortex, and you can't really see it in this particular image, but it's it localized in those default mode network areas. It spreads ultimately to cover much of the brain and down uh, into the brainstem in very late stages of the disease. In tau, the progression is even more kind of stereotyped and stepwise, and occurs in the stepwise fashion. So the the um, neurofibrillary tangles appear first in this locus ceruleus, which we heard a little bit about earlier as well, and then the per, then move into the transenterinal regions, which then moves into the hippocampus proper, and then spreads into other cortical regions and throughout the entire cortex. Now, so this kind of um, spread has been described from just classic neuropathology, but without any real understanding of the mechanism for how this spread might happen. It's very striking that the, the spread happens, or looks to be happening between synaptically connected regions. And then uh, uh, with this recent idea that these, these molecules can act in a prion-like fashion, we kind of marry these, um, these types of studies. So sugge the suggestion is that the pathological proteins can um, begin in a particular locus. We don't, still don't know why this lo one locus might be most vulnerable, but if they, it happens there, the pathological protein can then seed and cause the misfolding and aggregation of the uh, normal proteins in downstream areas. So for our mouse Alzheimer's project, there are a few larger questions that we are trying to address, um, and they're listed here. So I just want to talk through some of these, and then I'll tell you more about the platform that um, we're using to try to address these. So the first is, can we understand the large-scale network alterations and selective vulnerability observed in human patients using the mouse models, of, using mouse models of Alzheimer's disease? I think this is a really key question that sort of gets to the initial problem potentially with the translation between preclinical and clinical trials. We don't actually know if our mice are modeling this aspect of the disease. We don't know how much of the disease they do successfully model and whether we can rely on them for studying again this kind of large-scale network model. So we're really keeping an open mind hopefully about whether they even have this kind of large-scale network um, degeneration or issues that have been described in human patients. The next question is, can we predict or model the progression of the pathology using normal connectivity in mice? And then a third is, can we identify specific types of projection neurons that are most vulnerable to these pathologies and that might be instrumental to disease progression? So I'll tell you a little more about what I mean by that. And then the final one is, are there and what are the alterations in structural network properties in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease and are they related to other measurable pathologies? So as I said, this was built on, or this project is built on the platform from the Allen Mouse Connectivity Atlas project, and so I wanted to um, go over what that project looked like. And this is the landing page from our, um, from the Allen Mouse Connectivity Atlas. If you go to the website, you can see this. What we um, 
planned for in this project was really two phases that are now complete. The first phase was to map interaerial connections, long distance structural connections between all of the brain areas of, in a young adult, normal, healthy mouse. Um, we did this in the first phase in wild type mice. The second phase was meant to expand on that um, by mapping projections from genetically identified populations of neurons using Cree driver mice. So, um, what we have on the website here are o now over 2,000 experiments, around 450 to 500 of them are from the wild type animals where we use just an AAV GFP tracer, and then the re remainder of them are from Cree driver animals where we use a Cree dependent AAV GFP tracer. Um, and yeah, so you can go and explore and it sounds like hopefully many people are using this resource already. But in order to get to that final product, we had to build this high throughput pipeline, which is uh, the, the key pieces are shown here. So it starts with an injection of the viral tracer into a particular area of the brain, um, followed three weeks later by a uh, sacrifice and extraction of this brain um, for imaging on a serial two photon tomography imaging system. And this imaging system is really key for this uh, particular project. So what it does is it's essentially a block face imaging system that has a vibratome incorporated so that you can take an image of the section, take a, uh, do a slice, take another image, do a, uh, another slice. What this allows is very good um, registration and alignment back into three dimensions of the entire image stack. Um, everything goes through this QC process and annotation of the injection sites, and then all of the image series goes through our informatics data processing pipeline, which includes um, some pre-processing steps as well as, most importantly, detection of the fluorescent signal, as well as alignment and registration of these image series into our um, Allen, 3, or Allen 3D reference space, the mouse common coordinate framework. All of this data can then be pushed up onto the web. So here's just one example of, of what this looks like. Uh, this is an injection of, into a wild type animal in the primary motor cortex. And I'm going to just show you um, this. The movie is just a, basically a fly through of 140 sections. You can see the injection site was there. 140 coronal sections that we collect from every brain with the fluorescence um, just shown so that you can kind of track it throughout the entire brain. Um, it's not just uh, this kind of low resolution image that I sampled for, down sampled for a presentation here. There's a lot of uh, beautiful anatomy that is available in the raw images that, um, so you can go and look at them under, uh, on the website you can see each individual image and look at them under a higher magnification view here and here just to see the kind of detail that is captured by this uh, microscope. So, what we uh, then did in this first phase to kind of complete the collection of this was to, um, to complete the collection and to generate this connect, the first connectome was to use the data where we, uh, from all the injection experiments that we had in the wild type animals to cover all of these different major brain divisions. And so in the end, I think this number has actually gone up since the publication, but it's around 450 to 500 injection experiments um, that blanket the whole brain. Uh, there are gaps uh, um, in particular areas, um, most notably in areas like the hippocampus and the cerebellum. The in there are injection experiments into all of the structures in the mouse um, ontology in our mouse CCF, but for regions that are very big, we didn't necessarily cover every um, kind of empty space that's in there. But there are, um, so this is this is the coverage that we're dealing with. And again, we missed very few, or we, we missed very few structures um, in terms of generating this first connectome. So from each of those injection experiments, we can get this quantification of projection signal from all of the areas that are annotated in the mouse uh, common coordinate framework. And this is um, what the quantification looks like for each injection experiment. And then when we put the, all the data together, we get this uh, connectivity matrix, which is shown here. So each row is a different injection experiment, and each column is a target um, in the, in the um, Allen Reference Atlas. So, um, and the colors correspond to the strength of the connection. You can already see that there's you know, some interesting patterns that kind of pop out when you look across the whole brain. Um, and I'm not gonna go into that in any detail in this talk, but um, I will show you, I guess, the next slide I think I still have in here. 
what we um, found first, I guess from here, before I move on, move on is that um, each of these is not really a surprise to anyone that does kind of tracing experiments, but each of these injection experiments um, result in infection in uh, neighboring brain regions. It's very rare to have, uh, at least for this phase of the atlas, it's very rare to have an injection that's centered um, and also would fill a one particular brain area. So we um, wanted to kind of use the messiness of the biological data to build a computational model that will help us predict the actual strength in the, between a source and a target area independent of kind of the, um, the spillover into these other cortical areas. And so with the um, help and under the direction of our some very talented mathematicians that we have, uh, we're able to come up with this computational model that predicts the connectivity strength between um, 200 and I think 13 at this iteration 213 different sources and all of the targets that are in the reference atlas or the common coordinate framework. Um, and what this allows us to do is even more kind of sophisticated analysis of brain organization and um, um, uh, other kind of rules that we can look at. Okay. So what this helped us do was, or I'm going to go through the features of the, the projectome before I go into how we're using this for the Alzheimer's mice. Um, it features whole brain coverage, single axon resolution, uh, high precision. We get high precision co-registration of all the data sets into a common three-dimensional space. It's quantifiable. It allows us to retain this in a realistic 3D spatial location and topography of the targets as well as the fiber tracks. And then what I didn't talk about today, um, because this is another major project, is the Creline-based cell type specific projections. What this enables is, as I mentioned, this kind of more uh, sophisticated computational network analysis, more refined delineation of anatomical boundaries in 3D, so we're already using this data set to help us refine our mouse common coordinate framework as well, and, and also anterograde uh, tracing from sources as well as virtual retrograde tracing because of the comprehensive nature of all of the injection experiments covering most of the brain. Okay, so I'm not going to read through these again, but just to come back to the mouse Alzheimer um, project questions. Um, I want to tell you how we're applying that platform to answer these questions. So one, remember that I said that um, we're very interested in understanding uh, the vulnerability of the default mode network, that this is a large-scale functional network that's altered in Alzheimer's disease. One of the first questions, of course, that you may have and that we had is do mice have a default mode network at all? Is this even, you know, in terms of thinking about whether the mice can model the, the disease progression, we need to know whether this is true. So the answer seems to be yes, that um, there's uh, been a series of studies over the last, um, I guess, four years and even uh, more recently for the mouse that show that under light anesthesia, mice and rats do have um, activity patterns, resting state activity patterns that are reminiscent of uh, default mode network um, uh, areas in human here. So our questions then, do Alzheimer's disease mouse models have altered DMN connectivity and does the spread of amyloid pathology follow the anatomical connections in the DMN? So functionally, they appear to have a, a default mode-like network at least, and um, we looked at our connectivity data set, our, our cortical, specifically at the cortical and hippocampal connectivity data set to see if there's evidence for a structural correlate of the default mode network as well. So this is work that's done by Jennifer Whitesell, who will have a poster as well on this, so she can tell you even more about it. I'm just going to briefly go over her results, which are that when she subjects the cortical connectivity data to um, kind of graph, uh, graph theory analysis looking for community structure, and um, we can, she, what she pulls out are six different modules of areas that are highly interconnected with each other, and many of them, um, when you look at them, make sense in terms of, so here's module one and module two that are mapped down here. They look strikingly similar to what has been described for the mouse um, and other uh, uh, default mode network regions. So what this does, before I go into that, is give us a place to start to test this, um, uh, this question about whether there are specific projection neurons that might um, be vulnerable to the disease and might be instrumental in the progression of the disease. And so the specific hypothesis that we want to test first is whether there is this class of neurons that preferentially link default mode network areas at the end that there would be a different set of projection neurons um, that go to targets outside of the default mode network. So just to be more specific about that, um, the idea, so one, one thing to note is that 
for example, the anterior cingulate cortex, has projections not just within its module and not just to these other modules, but it has projections to many other targets as well that fall into areas that are not considered the default mode network. So why would disease spread to uh, selectively within default mode network areas and not to these other, not through these other connections if there is this prion-like propagation of disease? And so again, one possibility is that there's a specific class of projection neurons, an anatomical class of projection neurons that might preferentially link up those areas. So we're using uh, the, the canine adenovirus Cree and, and Cree-dependent AAV strategy that we heard uh, even we heard a little bit about from um, both Larry Zweifel and Li Chun Lo earlier uh, without the, all the fancy new kind of tools that they demonstrated. But what we're trying to do is to label um, projection neurons that are in a particular area within these DMN regions that are defined by their targets. And then we can map, uh, so using this, so this is a CAV2 Cree virus, it's a retrogradely transported virus that will take Cree back to all of the, uh, to all of the input areas. We can inject then this Cree-dependent AAV, um, e expressing EGFP to label those projection neurons, and then map their full brain-wide projections. Um, and we'll do this for all the different combinations of uh, regions that are in and outside of the default mode network. Okay, I think this is one of my last slides. So the second aspect of this project is to look for whether there are structural alterations in, in uh, the connectivity specifically in an Alzheimer's mouse model. So this is um, the beginning of that. We haven't made, we have this is still early stages, so we're just beginning to do this. This is an injection of the AAV tracer into the um, orbital cortex, I believe, from a, a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. This is an APPPS1 mouse model. And so you can see that we can apply the same platform to label kind of the projections brain-wide, as well as um, this kind of starry sky <laughs> in here. Are, um, is due to a dye that uh, is able to cross the blood-brain barrier and, and label all of the amyloid beta deposits that are in this particular mouse. So we can collect um, images uh, simultaneously of the axons that are um, labeled in these mice as well as the amyloid beta pathology. And then this is just a zoom to show that. These are the plaques and then the, the neurites that are around it. Okay, so to wrap up, um, what we're doing is trying to use our connectivity atlas platform to map whole brain projections in large scale disease relevant networks in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. The mouse model will allow us to do multi-scale analyses of um, this long distance structural connectivity with other microscale pathologies. We'll attempt to use these data sets once we get them to build a computational model to predict disease progression and that the platform is robust and flexible for other mouse models as well. So thank you for, uh, to the entire Allen Institute and particularly to our founders, Paul G. Allen and Jody Allen for their support. And then there's a, a smaller group of us that are really working specifically on this particular project. Um, I really wanna highlight now Jennifer Whitesell who has a poster as well on this. So you should go talk to her for more detail. And this is funded by a grant from the NIA. Thank you. Thanks, very nice talk. Um, Questions or comments from the audience? Uh, yes, in the back, we have mics on the side. It's coming back to you. Do you have any information on, is that on? Can you hear me? Okay. Hear. Do you have any information on how much the mesoscale map might change uh, between different mice or different strains of mice? We don't yet, that's a, yeah, you mean even just between normal mice, right? right? Yeah, we don't have that information um, because the mesoscale map is built as a, you know, built from many different animals. It's, it's hard to get kind of individual variability, I guess, in there. Um, we have some measures of individual variability for specific regions. The, but the other thing is that part of this project that um, is coming up is that we've done a pilot where we can look at different uh, strains of mice, but also, um, different ages, and so I think that will begin to address your question a little bit too, that we can, we can look to see whether the, the connectivity changes with age as well. And d one last one is, if during disease progression, the nervous system starts to exhibit some plasticity and rewire, um, and the pathology is a little different in each animal, are you gonna see that, or are you gonna miss that? I think it depends on the magnitude of that change, right? So I don't know the answer yet, but th yeah, we're definitely try to know the answer to that. Yeah. Back in the back there. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the, uh, I don't really know that much about these mice. What, do they have the sort of behavioral benefit of the Alzheimer's patients? 
to, and and are, are you going to try to use that to correlate to the degeneration you see in the networks? Yeah, absolutely. So we, I, I didn't talk about that today, but we are also, so th this particular strain of mice, this APPPS1 line, does have documented deficits in several memory um, tasks. And um, we are trying to bring that in-house and, and run every mouse, basically, that gets an injection through a behavioral task to get the measure before we do the, the whole brain mapping. Um, that's coming up. We're getting there. But, so we will build that in. The other thing that's challenging, though, just in general, is which mouse line to choose, I guess. And so mo most, I mean, I don't know how specific your question was to the APPPS1 mice, but most of the mouse models of Alzheimer's disease have deficits that, um, that result in, or have behavioral deficits in learning and memory tasks, but to various de different degrees and at various different ages. So it's a challenge to find the right one. <laughs> Yes, last question here. Um, so where, where the plaque is, there's, of course, there's no cells or axons or, or dendrites. Um, but is, is it known from the human, um, <coughs> I guess, maybe post-mortem silver staining or something? So what, what do axons do when they go, when they go into a, a plaque? Is that, does that become a disconnection? Does the axon turn? It looked like, I don't know, just one image at the yeah. end, it looked like there was some local degeneration. Well, there's definitely, um, it's been known for a long time that there, there, there's this dystrophy, called so dystrophic neurites that are around plaques. And there are uh, groups of people, um, uh, Brad Hyman and Tara Spires-Jones, one that have shown that, the that axons do take weird kind of twisted trajectories when they encounter a plaque, and that can change as over the course of degeneration in mice. Um, I'm not sure in humans how that works. So we know that there, there's likely to be um, kind of we don't know if there's going to be massive loss, I guess, of axons, but there's likely to be local changes in the structure of the axons around the plaques. Thanks very much, Dr. Harris.